I'm Kip, one of the pastors here at Asbury. Thanks for joining us for worship today. We are on week four of our ghost story series. The Bible's full of stories of mysterious, supernatural encounters with God, and we're looking at five of those stories during this series, asking what do they mean? How did people who first heard them understand them, and how do we understand them today? What do they tell us about the presence and power of God? Well, I've always had sort of a love-hate relationship with ghost stories. I remember as a boy, I loved watching scary movies on TV. Ghosts and monsters, Frankenstein, Dracula. And I'm not sure why I liked watching them. Maybe a part of me was trying to show how brave I was, while another part of me just wanted to dive under the covers and, and hide from them. But, uh, I was scared. <laughs> But I remember also as a kid, I had a couple posters in my bedroom that I, I bought. One was of the Wolfman and one was of Dracula from the old movies. And I'm not sure why I hung those posters in my bedroom because sometimes I would literally walk into my room and I would be startled by the posters even though I knew they were there. I mean, I wanted them to be there, but when I actually saw that they were there, I was scared of them. You know, kind of a, a dumb kid, huh? Well, our gospel lesson today is a ghost story from Luke chapter 24, beginning at verse 36. It's Luke's account of Jesus appearing to his disciples after his death. And the disciples think he's a ghost. They're, they're scared, they're terrified, startled. Here's how, here's how Luke tells the story. While they were still talking about this, and the this is Jesus appearing to some of the people on the road to Emmaus, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And they were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Well, when Jesus is standing among them, it's after his death on the cross, it's after his resurrection. Luke's gospel says they were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. They could not believe their eyes. They knew enough to realize that dead bodies don't come back. And they knew enough about what had happened to Jesus two days earlier to know he had died, he had been killed. And so seeing something that looked like Jesus, they could only conclude it was a ghost or spirit as the Greek literally reads. So naturally, they would be spooked. Even though they had heard Jesus had risen from the dead, and even though Jesus had predicted this themselves, himself, you know, they were still freaked out by it. I mean, they wanted him there, but when they actually saw him there, they were scared of him. Dumb kids, disciples. But, but you gotta love those disciples. I mean, they're so human that even after the resurrection, even after seeing him, they have a hard time getting things right. Now, I don't know about you, but that gives me a lot of hope. I mean, I don't have to have a perfect faith before I can follow Jesus. It means I can have my doubts, my fears, my confusions, and I can still be the kind of person Jesus accepts. No, the kind of person Jesus actually chooses to be a follower, a disciple. So if you're someone who struggles with faith, if you find yourself doubting or confused, maybe this story can be an encouragement to you because you're just the sort of person Jesus can use on his team. 
Well, noticing his disciples were terrified by his appearance, Jesus said to them, why are you troubled and frightened? Why, why do doubts rise in your mind? And Jesus didn't wait for a reply to his, his question. Rather than, rather than rebuking his disciples for the lack of faith, he simply offers proof that he is real, not a ghost. He says, look at me, touch me. I'm not a ghost, you don't have to be afraid. And then to reiterate the point, Jesus asks them for something to eat and they give him, says a piece of broiled fish and he puts it in his mouth and he chews it. He swallows it, and I can imagine the disciples are watching carefully. A piece of fish didn't fall through him onto the floor. I mean, he was real. The fish was proof that he was not a ghost. They were satisfied. They could believe it because they saw it with their eyes. And those disciples began to change from a frightened, hopeless, confused huddle of people into followers who would be propelled into action to transform the world. They would go out and start proclaiming the victory of God in Christ, not because they were sentimental about their time with Jesus. They were gonna go out empowered to action, not because the resurrection is a nice story about good overcoming evil. No, their lives began to change. They were empowered to act because they believed that Jesus Christ was risen from the dead. His body was no longer in a tomb. His resurrection pointed to their resurrection and our resurrection to hope and salvation for the world. And the disciples were willing to live out that conviction. They were willing to die for that conviction. In fact, most of them did. It reminds me of a phrase I heard a number of years ago. I, I wish I could remember who, who said it, but it goes like this. They say, a body without a spirit is a corpse. And a spirit without a body is a ghost, but a body with a spirit is the hope of the world. Well, the church, that's you and me, the church is the body of Christ with the Holy Spirit, the spirit of Christ, and Christ is the hope of the world. You and I are the hands and feet of Christ offering hope to the world. Well, John's Gospel tells the story of Jesus appearing to his disciples in that locked room a little different than Luke's Gospel. One of the big things is that Thomas is not with them when Jesus appears, according to John's Gospel. You remember doubting Thomas? Does anybody else appreciate Thomas uh, the way I do? You know, the way John's Gospel tells the story, Thomas comes later and enthusiastically the other disciples tell them they saw Jesus, he's alive, but Thomas, uh, he doesn't believe it. I won't believe it until I see it. He must have thought they were dreaming, you know, that their desire to see him caused them to see him, that, you know, kind of like a hungry person dreams about food or a guy stranded in the desert who's thirsty sees water, a mirage. Maybe those disciples told Thomas about the fish. You know, Jesus ate a piece of fish. and He probably laughed at their fish. He didn't like that as a test of whether Jesus was real or not. Thomas came up with his own test to know if Jesus is real. He said, he needs to show me his hands. He needs to show me his side. Let me see his wounds. If he has wounds, I'll believe. If there's no wounds, if there's no scars, forget about your fish, forget about him. Well, a week later, Jesus appeared again. This time, Thomas was with them. Was he real? Was he an imposter? The others looked to Thomas. It doesn't say that Thomas had time to approach the appearance and ask, may I see your hands? May I see your feet? May I see your side? Instead, it says Jesus reached out to show his hands. Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out, put it in my side. Don't doubt, believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Thomas saw Jesus' hands, his feet, his side. He saw the wounds, the scars, and he believed, my Lord and my God. Someone said that Thomas left us with a test, the Thomas test, a test we can use to measure our Christianity. It's not a fish test to see if Jesus is a ghost or if he's real, it's the Thomas test See if our discipleship is real. What are, what are we doing with our hands, our feet, our lives? That's the Thomas test. Because if we say we're followers of Christ, if we're a Christian, 
we are asked, may I see your hands? May I see your feet? May I see your side? If you have the wounds, the marks, the scars because of, of your interest and thirst for justice and honesty and integrity, because of our self-giving care and compassion and everything else Jesus lived and died for, well, others will believe. Well, our lives should show our faith that we're following Christ. And then, but only then, if we show those, will we have passed the Thomas test. I'd like to share something that I experienced 26 years ago, an experience of people using their hands and feet and lives to share their faith in Jesus. It was back in July of 1994. I spent a week in Eagle Butte, South Dakota with 1,500 volunteers for Habitat for Humanity. The goal was to build 30 new homes in five days. Former President Jimmy Carter was there, told us on the first night, on that Sunday night, that it would be gratifying, challenging, unpredictable, and it was. He also said, this is a spiritual journey. It was. In fact, one of the most profound spiritual experiences of my life. Here's a couple pictures of President Carter and his wife. One's from 26 years ago and one from two years ago, still working with Habitat. The goal of Habitat for Humanity is to completely eliminate poverty, housing, and homelessness. And it will accomplish this lofty goal by making substandard housing and homelessness socially, politically, morally, and religiously unacceptable. Those working with Habitat believe it can be accomplished because God has called them, because they're seeking to follow God's leading in the work, and because the Bible assures them that with God, all things are possible. It was a miraculous work of God to watch 30 homes emerge from the prairie soil east of Eagle Butte in five days. It was, it was unbelievable. I worked with a crew on house number 20, and that house was sponsored by the United Methodist Churches of North and South Dakota. Out of the 30 volunteers working on that house, 17 were United Methodists from our conference, including folks from Asbury, Bill and Alice Whitmer, Donna and Vern Luke, Cindy Nelson and Michelle Olson's parents from Canton, Mavis and Alan Stearns were on that home. Also people from Florida, Pennsylvania, California, Colorado, Michigan. We worked with the homeowners, Ken and Winona Clown. Ken was a 32-year-old police officer, a member of the Army Reserves and also an EMT. They had four children with one on the way. And I got to know Ken right away as we helped deliver and unload 60 doors and frames from a semi-trailer. Well, Ken and his wife lived on a winding asphalt road lined with poverty and decline. The housing he lived in was kind of run down. The HUD houses were so poorly constructed that people, they shouldn't have been living in them, but there was nowhere else, nowhere else to go. In the last 12 years before that, 13 different families that occupied the house where Ken and his family were living. And when his family moved in two years prior, he found the window screens didn't fit right, holes in the plaster, the January wind felt like it was blowing right through the uninsulated walls. Even with the furnaces running 24 hours a day, they, the family needed portable heaters to warm their house in the winter. And what was mind-boggling was the fact that Ken and his family willingly, gladly took the house. They had to. Uh, they, were, they were desperate. Well, as you might imagine, Ken was pretty excited about the new house and the construction taking place. Now, on the, about the third day, Ken was just sort of wandering around outside the house, and I, I approached him and asked, How are you doing today, Ken? And he said, uh, I don't know. I haven't been able to do anything. I just wander around and stare because I can't believe it. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. Well, at the end of the week on Friday, the house was done. 30 houses all completed. All the painting done, kitchen cabinets and appliances in place, fixtures hung, the carpet laid and shades put up. We were ready for the three o'clock dedication service. And we gathered in the home, the crew and the family to celebrate, to 
pray and to sing, to offer gifts, to burn sweet grass, to say what anybody wanted to say. And it's easy to recall but hard to describe the feelings that overwhelmed our group of volunteers as Ken tried to say more than thank you, but the tears choked his words and his wife's tears kind of mixed with his and it seemed like everybody's tears were flowing that afternoon. And one of the volunteers, a United Methodist from Timber Lake, summed it up, kind of summed it up for me. His name's Al, a contractor, a rancher, a cowboy. He had the cowboy hat and the cigarettes and the, and the piece of chew stuck between his teeth. He had a great sense of humor and a cordial smile. And, and talking about the week of work, you know, with our hands and our feet and our lives together, he said, he said, this to me is what God is about. I think he was right. It's, it's what God is about. It's about showing our hands and showing our feet. It's about showing with our lives, witnessing in tangible ways how Jesus Christ came to offer abundant life and eternal life. United Methodists in the Dakotas and people across the country worked together to try to pass the Thomas test that week. Well, in his book, The Company of the Committed, Elton Trueblood writes, Somewhere in the world, there should be a society consciously and deliberately devoted to the task of seeing how love can be made real and demonstrating love in practice. Unfortunately, there's only one candidate for this task. If God, as we believe, is truly revealed in the life of Christ, the most important things to God is the creation of centers of loving fellowship which in turn infect the world. I think I wonder if that phrase infect the world is a bad choice for our season of life or if it's a good choice of word because maybe that brings to life that centers of loving fellowship as he writes that's the church centers of loving fellowship should in turn infect the world that is the church should spread love like a virus and true blood concludes that paragraph saying whether the world can be redeemed in this way, we do not know, but it is at least clear there is no other way. How are you doing with the Thomas test? I'm, I'm not asking you or expecting you to go out and help build a house this week, but I am asking you to show me your hands, your feet, your life, how will you put your faith into action this week to show that Jesus is real, that he's not a ghost? What will you do to show that Christ is alive today? I mean, maybe it's something as simple as making a phone call to somebody who needs to hear a friendly voice, or maybe it's writing a letter or sending a card to someone who, who needs encouragement. Maybe it's helping rake someone's yard. Maybe it's writing a check or sending a gift to the church or sending it to another organization that is making a difference in the world. You can, you can think of ideas. What's God calling you to do to put your faith into action? What can you do to show that Jesus is real? Or, what, or more importantly, what will you do to show that Jesus is real? If you're watching us on Sunday morning, I'd invite you to leave a comment in the chat to share what you might feel prompted to do this week. Maybe your idea will motivate others to think about what they might do. What will you do this week to show that Jesus is alive? Because you're just the sort of person that Jesus can use. A, a body without a spirit is a corpse. A spirit without a body is a ghost. But a body with a spirit is the hope of the world. Well, the church, that's you and me, the church is the body of Christ with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ. And Christ is the hope of the world. So can, can I see your hands? May I see your feet? Show me your life. You're the hands and feet of Christ. You can offer hope, the hope of the world, Christ. You can offer Christ through your hands, through your feet.
through your life. Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, we do thank you for your uh, grace and love that's revealed in the risen Christ. We know that without Jesus, we are locked in fear. So I pray that you come to us and fill us and teach us, teach us to be your hands and feet. Send us where we're needed and help us to see others with eyes that are unclouded by division and fear. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.